Hi, everyone, and welcome to the ARC's National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability second webinar in our 2017 Policing and People with Disabilities series, Community-Based Strategies for Reform. My name is Ariel Sims, and I am the Criminal Justice Fellow here at NCCJD. Before we begin our presentation, I would like to cover a few basics, including logistics for those of you who may be new to WebEx. All participants are in listen-only mode. If you have any technology issues during the webinar, please call the WebEx help desk at the number shown on the slide and the number that also appears in the chat box. If you would like to access live captioning, just copy and paste the link I provided on the slide and in the chat box into a new browser window. Today's webinar will start with a series of speakers. After we hear from all the speakers, there will be time for questions from our participants in the audience. You can post your questions in the Q&A section on WebEx, also found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you don't want your name shared with your question, you can just type the word private before your question. You can also email questions to nccjdinfo at thearc.org after the webinar. If we don't get to your question during the presentation, we'll make sure to follow up with you afterward. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website along with the PowerPoint slides and a transcript about one week from today. A quick note about language. NCCJD has a preference to use people first language and other language that is commonly used within the disability community. Many of our presenters today, though, are coming to us from outside of the disability community, and as such, they may use different language. One final logistical request, a short survey will pop up after the webinar has ended. Please take a few minutes to complete it. This survey will help ensure that you are satisfied with future NCCJD webinars and provides us with valuable feedback. This webinar is funded by the United States Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. With logistics covered, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you more about the ARC's National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability and our 2017 Policing and People with Disabilities webinar series. The ARC's National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability, or NCCJD for short, is a clearinghouse for information, resources, training, and education on topics at the intersection of criminal justice reform and disability with an emphasis on intellectual and developmental disabilities. We were created back in 2013 with a grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We advocate at the intersection of criminal justice reform and the advancement of disability rights. And we work on both sides of the criminal justice system. If you could say there are two sides. We work on issues related to victims and witnesses of crimes, but also on issues facing those who are charged with crimes and or incarcerated. Our overall mission is to build the capacity of the criminal justice system to respond to gaps in existing services for people with disabilities, whether they are involved as victims, witnesses, suspects, defendants, or incarcerated individuals. Some of the activities we do include training, technical assistance, publication of resources, dissemination of resources, and education. This is the second webinar in our 2017 Policing and People with Disabilities series, and we plan to highlight potential solutions to police use of force against people with disabilities from around the country, ranging from community-based programs to emerging employment opportunities for people with disabilities in the community. We hope you'll continue to join us for these conversations as we try to shift from the problem itself to potential solutions. And if you know of a unique program or policy addressing the intersectional nature of this issue, please feel free to share that with us via the NCCJD email. With that, I wanna say thank you to all of our participants for being with us today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here. And I would also, of course, like to thank our presenters on today's webinar. We have representatives from the Albuquerque Police Department, Representatives from People on the Go of Maryland and Travis Agins will speak to us from Growth Through Opportunity based out of Virginia.
And with that brief introduction, I'd like to invite our first group of presenters from the Albuquerque Police Department to introduce themselves and tell us what they've been doing to reform policing culture from within the APD on the topic of disability. Hi, I'm Karen Vendetti. I'm the curriculum writer with the CIU unit at APD. <laughs> I'm Matt Kinney. I'm one of the detectives of the Crisis Intervention Unit. And I'm Niels Rosenbaum. I'm a, a psychiatrist. I work with the Crisis Intervention Unit. And I'm Peter Winograd, <laughs> and I work uh, with data and policy. So, Errol, I hope I don't ruin this for you. But here we go. So, we're just going to go over kind of briefly what we're doing here in Albuquerque, especially with Albuquerque Police Department, and what we've done that's um, a little bit different or expanded with the crisis intervention team program or concept. And so we're just going to kind of go over that briefly. So here in, in New Mexico, we are the largest law enforcement agency. We currently have about 870 officers. And so that, those are officers that are assigned either to field services or detectives or just throughout the department. And so the last uh, information, just our metro area is a little over a million. And so the structure of our section, which we call the crisis intervention section, is listed on the screen. And so it, it is one of the largest mental health police units in the country. And so we are led by a psychiatrist, which is Dr. Rosenbaum. Mm -hmm. He's a medical director. We have a lieutenant, a sergeant. We have six detectives that are assigned for home visits and follow-ups. And we have four detectives that are assigned for the crisis intervention program. We also have two full-time clinicians. These are independently licensed master level clinicians, which in our local community can write certificates for evaluation and do assessments for people who might be in crisis. We have four crisis specialists. The easiest way I can put this is these are navigators in our community that we can refer people to that, that might have a disability or are living with a mental illness, that they connect them to services in the community. Inside of our field, so Uniform Patrol, we have six sergeant coordinators that focus on the CIT program. We have a data analyst, which is Dr. Winograd, and we'll talk more later. We have a data assistant for them. We have a curriculum developer, which is Karen. We were under a settlement agreement with the Department of Justice, and one of those is that we certify all of our field officers in the CIT program. And we also have an enhanced CIT program, which currently we have 97 officers with our goal to be up to 40% of our field services. And so just when it comes to the training, what we're doing that's kind of, I would say is beyond the traditional CIT concept. And I'm sorry, I heard somebody, I don't know if I... So beyond the, the CIT original concept, and for those of you that might not be familiar with CIT, it is a law enforcement-based program that is supposed to be bringing the community together to look for better outcomes for people who are living with a disability or you know, who might have interactions with law enforcement due to a crisis because of that, which has historically had some negative outcomes. So just on the training side of this, for what we give to our officers, when you become a police officer with the Albuquerque Police Department, you receive 57 hours of training related to behavioral health, to um, intellectual disabilities, case management, crisis management, de-escalation all together on that. After that, and you go on an on-the-job training program with a field officer, and you come back to us for what was a 40-hour CIT class, we just extended it to an additional eight hours after meeting um, Ariel, and so we're going to be doing another eight hours of intellectual disability, development of disability, um, following that 40 hours, which will be nice. We also have an enhanced CIT program. This is officers that volunteer to want to take these um, <clears throat> somewhat difficult calls at times and have an enhanced knowledge and continue with ongoing training on it. We did start, and this is a very unique one, called the CIT Knowledge Network. So we have a hub of experts. We have Dr. Rosenbaum's on there. We have two other psychiatrists, um, a CIT detective, and a crisis specialist. We do weekly trainings, so online. Similar to like this is a webinar, except for it's more of a, I think of a conference, like if you were in a room with a bunch of people. You see everyone's face. We give a short lecture about something that's related to CIT policing. It could either be about an illness, about a disability, about a resource, or just communication strategies. And then we actually staff cases and calls for service with a goal to, to promote this style of policing and to raise the standard and set, um, 
standards in CIT policing for that stuff. And so we do it nationally. So anyone can go to it. It's a free training. Um, it is dedicated to public safety, though, because we do staff actual calls for service and, and people that we're trying to help. We do a refresher training for law enforcement every two years. We have a two-hour in-service for that. And to maintain your certification in enhanced CIT, you also have to have eight hours in every um, two years to maintain that. One of the unique things that we do I put on here, medical students, is we actually teach the medical students. And it's a way that we can kind of incorporate law enforcement with medical providers to kind of reduce the stigmas on both sides. So hopefully when these doctors and providers go out to their communities, they feel more comfortable with law enforcement. We provide a lot of training for the community as well, be it safety training, de-escalation training, or just in self-awareness. And one of the unique things we have is Karen is the curriculum writer, so she helps us out a lot with that, but she can talk about herself. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's important, um, one of the main things that I find that's so positive about what our unit does is that a lot of people have this negative impression that when there's a crisis, it's because something bad happens. And like Matt was saying, there's always has typically been a negative outcome. But with the right training and, and learning that it's a lot of communication techniques that can be used to de-escalate, that that is a safety tool. And so it's important to have real-life scenario, real-life um, case studies that are appropriate and relevant to field officers to what they do every day so that all of this training is relevant for them and they can go right back into the field and use it. So I think we work as a solid unit to provide appropriate training. It's very important. And so beyond a traditional CIT program, um, we do have, so our goal is to have full-time detectives of 12. So hopefully we're just now at 10 detectives. We have full-time and hopefully in the next two months we'll have an additional two. We should have a total of six full-time crisis specialists. We have six area commands um, where officers are stationed out of. We try to include a co-specialist or a crisis specialist in each of those to help field officers direct in the community there. And like I said before, we have two full-time clinicians. That's not normal for law enforcement. That's very unique. And probably the, the most unique thing that we have, I would say, is Dr. Rosenbaum. And I think we are the only department that has that. I think we are the only department with a, a full-time psychiatrist. Absolutely. I've been working with APD for 10 years. I started as a contractor, and then I moved in to work with um, as an employee for the last few years. It's been great working here, and we're also very, to go back and talk about the training, we're very excited about the, we've just recently added an additional eight hours to our basic training that all officers will get after they come out of the academy, about six months after the academy. Um, and that new eight hours will be specific to uh, intellectual and uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, so we're developing that now, and um, we're reaching towards our local community and the national community for help and guidance on that, because it's, uh, it's a new training for us, and we're really excited. Did so something just go big? Um, and my role here has changed over the years. I was, I was, I was the clinician, so I was going out in the field and evaluating people uh, and helping them get into services uh, by using psychiatric evaluations and connections in the community. Um, <clears throat> about a year ago, I was promoted to the, the director. I still go out in the field not as much as I used to, though. Uh, we do come across people with intellectual disabilities, and um, we try to help and serve them as well as we do uh, anybody else in our unit. So thank you for giving us the time to talk to us. And after Ariel came out here, I think one of the unique things in our training that I do encourage all the agencies or anyone listening, if you guys can get involved in the local law enforcement training, it, it does wonders. We use local providers and people that are either living with these disabilities to help teach officers to break down those stigmas. Um, one of the unique things at APD is we actually employ people living with disabilities to help around the department. So officers are, are constantly seeing people living with intellectual disabilities or living with other disabilities in a positive life and not just seeing the negative. Oh, and the articles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matt's too shy, but Matt and I are, uh, just recently wrote an article that's going to be published in June 
in the American Journal of Psychiatry. So I don't know if anybody knows about that journal, but it's a, it's a fairly well-known uh, psychiatric journal. We're very excited about it. It also discusses uh, our model here. So keep an eye out. Stay tuned. Keep an eye out. <laughs> One of the greatest things I would say that we've finally been able to accomplish, too, is to actually get Dr. Winograd a, a data analyst. It's something that I think is lacking in law enforcement, especially when it comes to good statistics about interactions between law enforcement and people with disabilities, and where can we improve it or what's lacking on it. So I'll let Dr. Winograd kind of lead you on that. All right. Um, one of the most important things that we face in this uh, in this unit and in in the whole area of law enforcement and um, interactions with people with disabilities and people uh, suffering from mental health uh, issues um, is is telling the, the story in a positive way and fighting against some of the um, false narratives that are out there. Um, one of the things that we want to point out that I think will be helpful to you all, and you know this, um, data can be helpful in a couple of ways. Our biggest question here is how do we minimize police use of force with people living with mental illness? And there are data questions. How many calls for service are there? What are the demographics to those individuals? How was the encounter resolved? Um, for us, it's very important to track things like use of force or um, jail uh, deferral and, and taking people to emergency rooms. So those are data questions. And there's just sort of numbers associated with that or, or descriptions. And then you have practice and policy questions. And those are more difficult than just number questions. How do we train officers to handle encounters with people living with mental illness? How do we make sure that enough money is available? How do we improve the collaboration between the police and the mental health system? And then even beyond practice and policy questions, there are political questions. And as you know, data is always political. Who has the power to influence communities to take better care of people living with mental illness? Who has the influence to make sure that families, police, mental health providers, and others work together? In our community, probably like in your community, um, it often falls on the police alone to deal with these kinds of uh, challenges because other, uh, other groups don't want to pay attention. And so, we use data um, to answer data questions. We use it to inform for policy and practice questions. But mostly we use data to advocate um, for political questions and how do we get um, everybody to work together in a, in a good way. Um, here's some of the, the data slides that we've used. This one shows the number of Albuquerque Police Department CIT related 911 calls, and those are mental health and, and suicide are the, the names of the calls. And you can see they've increased 60% since 2010. That's a huge increase, and this really helps um, uh, the police department and the community, the mayor, um, the advocates, um, the entire community understand the size of the challenge that we're facing. And I think it's really helped um, increase the amount of resources for our unit. This talks about the time of day we get those calls. Along the bottom is a 24-hour clock. You see 12 in the middle, that's noon. And then 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Um, and you can see the, uh, the increase in calls we have a huge number of calls, and we have limited resources. So one of the most important questions we're wrestling with is, how do we make sure that officers are um, on duty when there are high needs? So um, you know, as calls change during the day, we can sort of track that. This is a map of Albuquerque. And for those of you that uh, 
uh, no Albuquerque. This is sort of a north-south view. That gray line is the Rio Grande River. I-25 goes north-south, I-40 goes east-west. Over to the east are some mountains, and these are police beats. Between 2010 and 2016, there were almost 19,000 behavioral health CIT-related uh, reports. And you can see um, some of the sections of our city uh, have much higher needs than others. And as you can imagine, um, uh, those are high poverty areas, those are high crime areas, all of the other social determinants of health um, that you can think of are in those same areas. But along with looking at the time of day, being able to look at the location helps APD know how to respond um, and use limited resources in, a, in the most effective way. Um, as I said, use of force is a big deal with us. Um, these are, this is from January 2016 to February of this year. The top is the number of CIT related incidents. That's, um, again, reports that uh, 911 kinds of reports. And you see along the bottom uh, whether uh, use of force has been there. And it's very important to point out that Albuquerque Police Department has broadened the definition of use of force. So even handcuffs or restraints to keep people from hurting themselves are counted as use of force. But one of the things we're most proud about is that um, with the training um, and the compassion that uh, our officers have, you can see most of those situations are handled with very, very little use of force. We also track what happens um, as a result of those uh, incidents. As you can see, the vast majority of, of these um, incidents end up with people going to the hospital, being taken to emergency um, rooms. We actually track which hospitals in our community um, handle those calls, and Dr. Rosenbaum has a good relationship with those hospitals. There's a lot of conversation over um, uh, how to strengthen the relationship when officers do bring individuals into the hospital. Um, a lot of them end up, uh, that's the no transport where officers come, it's handled easily or without a, a lot of fanfare, and no other action is needed. We, we have a fair number of completed suicides in, uh, in Albuquerque. Um, those are arrests and detentions, and then other support services. But we track these outcomes very carefully, and they really help inform the interactions our officers have, um, again, with the support services. And the most important message that we use this slide for, <clears throat> excuse me, is again, these interactions are not just um, uh, a challenge for the police, they're important for our entire community. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is an important one. We, We've been doing data analysis across the police department, and Albuquerque has had a, um, a sharp increase in homicide. We went from 30 homicides back in 2014 to uh, over 60 last year, so it's a doubling. And when we looked at those homicides, we saw a, a sharp rise in murder-suicide. We've been training our, our officers, our CIT officers, to deal with suicide, but we really hadn't been paying attention to murder-suicide. So because of these data, we trained the way, we've changed the way we're training our officers to have them talk to individuals who are co contemplating suicide and start to ask a little bit about what's going to happen to the family. We've had some heartbreaking cases of uh, mothers and children being uh, murdered, uh, along with an individual taking, uh, committing suicide. And this is the way we hope we can reduce uh, some of those uh, incidents in our community. 
Um, we'll stop there. Uh, we're, we'll be around for the whole um, webinar, so you can ask questions later. But mostly what we wanted to be able to do is give you a sense of how our unit is formed and um, the way we're trying to use data to be able to tell the story and advocate um, for community-wide responsive services. All right. Well, thank you so much, Neil, Karen, Matt, and Peter. Um, I'd now like to uh, introduce yeah. Ken and Matt of People on the Go of Maryland. Um, and just a quick note for you, those of you have, who have sent in some questions, uh, we will get to those. We'll just get to them at the end after we've heard from all the speakers. So go ahead and send your questions through the Q&A uh, function, and I will collect those, and then I will moderate questions at the end once we've heard from everybody. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ken and Matt. Ken Capone is a recognized leader in Maryland's self-advocacy movement. He directs the advocacy and public policy initiatives for people on the go of Maryland and is a valued member of the Developmental Disabilities Coalition. Mr. Capone sits on the United States President's Committee for Individuals with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, Community Advisory Council for the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities, and the Board of Disability Rights Maryland, along with various other state and local committees. He is well-versed in community living and the importance of directing one's own services. He studied computer programming at John Hopkins University, completed the Partners in Policymaking program, served as a legislative intern with the Maryland Senate, and worked as an Ask Me interviewer for the ARC of Maryland and Developmental Disabilities Administration. Mr. Capone was practically destined to become an advocate as his family was determined to ensure that he was fully included in society. Working with Disability Rights Maryland's, Disability Rights Maryland's ben phenomenal advocates to advance the rights of people with disabilities as a member of the board is deeply meaningful to him. And he wanted to share the following quote, what you do for yourself dies when you die, but when you do for others, what you do for others lives on after you are gone. Matt Rice is a graduate of the Maryland School for the Blind in Parkville High School, a former college student at CCBC, and former employee of Shared Support Maryland Incorporated. He is also a certified support broker and the People on the Go policy specialist. Matt is also a user of the Community Pathways Waiver, which he uses to organize his staff and vendors in the way that he sees fit. Matt sits on the Maryland Association of Community Services Board, as well as participating on various statewide committees. Matt plans to continue his career in self-advocacy, furthering the cause of civil rights for people with disabilities. So with that, Ken and Matt, I will turn things over to you. In recent years, we have seen encounters with law enforcement and people with disabilities rise. This rise in encounters could be contributed to that we are seeing more people with disabilities in the community. In 2013, a young man with Down syndrome lost his life while in police custody. The community was outraged after the senseless death. They held vigils. A petition was started by Ethan's sister that collected over 340,000 signatures. His mother testified on Capitol Hill. In 2014, the governor of Maryland issued an executive order which formed the Commission on Effective Community Inclusion for People with Disabilities. This group consisted of various law enforcement groups, disability organizations, This commission studied current police training standards as it relates to interactions with people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. The commission conducted listening sessions across Maryland to hear from the general public about what was needed in training police to interact with people with disabilities. Once the work of the Commission was complete, advocacy efforts began throughout Maryland's disability community to educate lawmakers on a bill for the Ethan Saylor Alliance for Self-Advocates as educators to mandate the creation of an alliance to train self-advocates teaching law enforcement about how to interact with people with ID or DD. 
The Ethan Saylor Alliance appointed self-advocates, family members, disability-related professionals, educators, and members of law enforcement. The Ethan Saylor Alliance Steering Committee will form the framework needed to support and facilitate self-advocates as educators for law enforcement and other public service entities. The Maryland Self-Advocacy Training Alliance, the Alliance, is a partnership of four statewide disability advocacy partners. The Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities of Canada Krieger Institute, People on the Go of Maryland, the ARC Maryland, and Pathfinders for Autism. The Alliance was formed to respond to a request for a proposal that was created by the Ethan Saylor Alliance Steering Committee. All partners bring different strengths to the project. The mission was to connect law enforcement trainers and law enforcement officers to disability awareness trainers around the state. hired 15 self-advocates out of 56 applicants. 
During this pilot program, 200 law enforcement officers have been trained to date. From those trainings, we have received lots of positive feedback. As you can see from the slide, we have 92% satisfaction rating. So, so, so the outcomes, you know, that we're really focused on for the um, for this pilot program are that people with disabilities uh, learn a, a new set of skills that will lead to employment. Uh, and. Uh, And, uh, and then uh, employment in law enforcement. Law enforcement officers come away with better disability awareness and tools for de-escalation. We hope to give law enforcement the tools and resources that is needed so law enforcement have confidence in their ability to de-escalate any situation that is arises. So some of the lessons that we've learned um, in the undertaking this project are that we've heard um, from each of our trainers that they really could have used more training time, uh, that it would have been beneficial to have uh, an expert in uh, law enforcement really as part of the initial train the trainer uh, process. Uh, and, and just in, uh, in general, you know, they really stated the, the need for uh, more, more practice hours. Every advocate that we spoke to said they felt like uh, they could have done more than what we had originally uh, slated for them if they had had more time and possibly, uh, you know, the opportunity to interact with a law enforcement official to really get their perspective. As I stated in the previous slides, we have gotten some really good feedback and comments from the trainings. I wanted to share a few with you. I thought the training was outstanding and one of the best in service classes I have had in 10 years. Having people come in with IDDs was eye-opening and really had impact. Thank you for what you do. Excellent training, was unsure what to expect, but I was very satisfied, gained a lot of skills that I will continue to use, thank you. Very good instructors, the persons with disabilities who assisted were very good speakers and helpful. Thank you so much, Ken and Matt, for sharing that with us. Um, I'd like to introduce next Travis Aikens. Travis Aikens is a recently retired law enforcement officer who dedicated 23 years working to enhance criminal justice in Virginia. Travis created the highly unique GTO, Growth Through Opportunity Cadet Program, as a police officer, and now runs the nonprofit GTO organization full-time with aspirations to expand nationwide. Travis is the recipient of an American Red Cross Local Hero Award, Harvard's Kennedy School Bright Ideas and Local Government Award, as well as the 2017 Champion of Change Organization of the Year Award from the National Down Syndrome Society. And Travis, uh, you can take it away. Very good. First of all, Ariel, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to be a part of this webinar today. Um, 
I'm very appreciative for this opportunity and, and uh, I've enjoyed listening through the other presentations with the Albuquerque Police Department as well as um, with people on the go with Ken and Matt. Uh, what y'all are doing is, is absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's, it's to be commended, all of your efforts. Um, I've lost uh, complete video here, so I don't know if you can hear me at all. So I am going to keep talking because I've lost everything here. Um, so I created the GTO Growth or Opportunity Program out of Roanoke, Virginia, while I was a full-time police officer in conjunction with our uh, amazingly innovative uh, police chief, Chris Perkins, um, who was very forward-thinking. And, and he and I and some community-based leaders teamed up to um, set out to develop and establish a program that was fully inclusive for all individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in our community. Um, so often those folks, in my personal opinion, are on the sideline of life. Uh, that just simply was not acceptable for any of us. Um, so we set out to develop this program it's called GTO, Growth Through Opportunity, I'm going to move through the slideshow here, if I can, or not. I'm experiencing quite the technical difficulty here. If you want, Travis, I can advance the slides. Just tell me next. Yeah, if you'll do that, please, that'd be great. Uh, I'm going to keep talking, Ariel. I can't see much of anything on my screen. Um, so Growth for Opportunity was developed as a two-way street. It's a hands-on learning approach um, for, for all first responders in a community. Um, it's, it's, it's a two-way street. Growth for Opportunity is absolutely a two-way street, a two-way training module, um, model, whereas individuals with varying intellectual and developmental disabilities to include those with autism, Down syndrome, Fragile X, childhood cancers, um, you name it, a variety of issues, um, disorders, are partnered up with their local first responders. And what we do is we come in and we train first responders to be those job coaches, to be those mentors uh, for those individuals. Um, so many times there's so many um, individuals in this world that have, number one, misperceptions about law enforcement. And truth be told, um, many law enforcement officers have misperceptions about those individuals with varying disabilities. So it's really a two-way street. So we work very diligently to break down those barriers, break down those misperceptions, combine the forces, combine the, the, the two entities together uh, to team up to, to, to better the lives and enhance the lives and, and raise the quality of life and confidence um, in all of those individuals, the police officers, the firefighters, the EMTs, as well as individuals with um, varying disabilities. You hit that next slide for me, Ariel. So, so what are some of the things that we do with the GTO program? So as you can see right here with this one young man uh, named Nicholas, um, first and foremost, you can see that they're in a unique uniform. It was critically important for, for us to establish a uniform for our young adults um, with, with autism and, 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 and other disabilities. Uh, we wanted them to assimilate into the culture of law enforcement, for them to assimilate and be quickly accepted into the culture of first responders. And it's also a very quick way for them to build confidence. So as soon as, as, soon as they would put their uniforms on, you could just see the way that they put their shoulders back and their chin up and their smile on their face. And many individuals who, who just lack the confidence would enter a room and they would, they would walk in and they would put their heads down for lack of confidence. But through this process, even as quickly as putting that uniform on, you could see them just, just exhale and feel proud about themselves. Some of them, honestly, for the very first times in their life. So, so that's why you're going to see many of these young men um, and women, by the way. And when I say young, uh, we have had them thus far between the ages of 18 and 56 years of age. Uh, many of these folks have been sitting around for 20 to 30 years doing not much of anything, which is extremely sad to me because we totally believe that everybody has a purpose 
in this life. Um, so what you're seeing right here is a young man named Nicholas. He's working in our forensic unit. He's filing 10 print cards. <laughs> Excuse me. And all you folks in law enforcement, it's obvious to us that those are 10 print cards, fingerprint cards, but to all the other folks out there, you may not know exactly what you're looking at. So what he's doing is he's teaming up. You can see a job coach off to the side. He is filing and organizing 10 print cards for the forensic unit. Now, it's, it's, it's stating the obvious here, but it's not to be overlooked. One of the other things that you see this young man doing is standing. As simple as that is to most all of us, it's very important that we enhance physical fitness through our program. Um, what good would it be for you to go through a program and at the end of the day, let's say we were able to successfully get you a job in the community, it wouldn't do you any good to, to gain successful employment and then just sit down on the job due to, due to employment fatigue. So even what you're seeing with this young man um, standing is very important because we do it Monday through Friday, uh, five hours a day, and we have mandatory physical fitness training, which you get to see in just a few minutes as well. You go to that next slide, Ariel. All right, so what you're looking at right here is a, is a wonderful young man named, named Joshua. And Joshua is working with a job coach as well as a computer crimes detective here. Um, he is going through um, CDs, and he's duplicating hundreds of CDs on behalf of the police department. Um, it's something that is very repetitive in nature. It's very routine-based. It's, it's obviously technology-based, and this young man thrives in that environment. Um, so we teamed him up with the computer crimes detective, and one of the duties that he would do inside the police department is he would um, uh, function as the individual who would replicate all of those CDs for the computer crimes uh, division. And I can tell you it was immensely helpful to everybody in the entire police department. Um, it was a job that took lots of time, um, lots of attention from the computer crimes detective that um, he didn't mind doing, but his efforts could have been better served elsewhere. So it was a great mix of us bringing in an individual who loved to be a part of the computer crimes unit, who loved and thrived on things that were repetitious in nature and felt a part of um, his police department in an effort to help. So that was uh, truly amazing. Next slide, Ariel. So one of the things I like to ask you is which one of these fine young ladies is a first responder and which ones are not. And upon first glance, it's really hard to tell because again, it was critically important for us to be able to allow them to assimilate into the culture of, of first responders. Um, so I think that's awesome. We also put that up there because I constantly get asked about, well, that, that's great, Travis, but do you have any females that have been through the program? Well, I think case in point right here is, is obviously so. So next slide, Ariel. All right, so once again, about breaking down barriers and misperceptions of law enforcement, we just don't do, we don't do job training and, and, and life training and social training within the walls of um, a, a police department or a sheriff's office or a fire department. We do that as well, but it's critically important for us to go outside the walls of the public safety agency. That way we can um, get more out to the community to, to show folks in our, in our community and a lot of other communities it's okay, take a deep breath, exhale. They may have a disability, but you know what? Don't we all, don't we all? We all have certain abilities and disabilities, if you will. Um, we all have to be very accepting. So one of the things that we did, it was, it was important for us to go into the local schools and the preschools and elementary schools to start breaking down those barriers. So you can see a young lady here named Jenny in our GTO cadet uniform. And by the way, Mr. McGruff, the crime dog has also played by a young man um, with autism. So they're going out and they're, they're reading to kids and slowly breaking down barriers. That way the kids are viewing them as just one of the pack. And that's totally awesome. Next slide. So again, we're all about um, social engagements. We're all about community engagements, community um, uh, involvement. So one of the things we do yearly uh, in Roanoke, Virginia is we are a, um, a, a wonderful participant in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, which brings out about 20,000 people, um, as well as the Christmas Parade. And we allow them, uh, our GTO cadets, to walk and ride with the police department, the sheriff's office, the fire department, our EMTs, um, to join forces. And what we're really saying by doing so is if we, your police department, 
if we, your sheriff's office, is willing to go above and beyond to partner up to shoulder with those with unique challenges, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities in this world, why can't you? So we are all about being pioneers and all about being trendsetters in our community, once again, in an effort to break down barriers. Next slide. So here's a young man named Tyler right here, and Tyler would go out with us to preschools, and one of the things that Tyler loved to do was he loved to engage with, with, with young children. Um, he's just a wonderful, passionate individual. We, just, we love him to death like we love all of our GTO cadets. Um, but one of the things he loved to do was also he loved to shred papers. That's his passion. He loves to shred documents. It was almost like anger management for him, uh, placing the papers through the shredder. Especially if he was having a bad day, he would even ask me, that, you know, Travis, do you mind if I go to the shredder and shred some documents for a minute? It makes me feel better. So he run the paper through the shredder. But one of the other things he also liked to do was he liked to pass out stickers to young kids. And it's very empowering for him to go out in a uniform alongside his local police department uh, with the canine unit and, and the detectives and, and the street officers and, and be a part of what we're doing for community-based solutions is, is so important for him. It's so empowering. It's so impactful. It's such a confidence builder. It's, it's been truly amazing. Next. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that we have mandatory physical training at the GTO Growth Through Opportunity Program, uh, which we did start in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, so it's not like we're sitting back and, and, and cracking the whip with uh, expectations that are ungodly. Uh, it's not what we do. We meet people where they are, um, and we build them up. It's very, very important for us to take a holistic approach to our training, uh, mind, body, and spirit, um, to, to enhance every level of their life. Um, think of it like this. You may have all the skills necessary. You may have the, res the, the recipe, the resume that is, that is, that is amazing that will, that will knock your socks off. But if you don't have the confidence to submit that application, all of that means absolutely nothing. So one of the other things we do through mandatory physical training, which, by the way, is daily for one hour, alongside of our police officers, our detectives, our firefighters, our EMTs, our police chief, fire chief, your sheriff, you name it. They all work out uh, with us, with the GTO cadets. It's also all about building much needed confidence for them to succeed, for them to be empowered, for them to feel more confident than ever before. And all that confidence transcends them to everything else that they're gonna do in this world. So that was critically important. Another thing that's also doing is it's reducing the fatigue factor. So it's a confidence builder. Of course, it's great for our cardiovascular health and endurance. That goes without saying. But it's also great to reduce employment fatigue for if and when we can also help these individuals get paid jobs in their community in which they reside, which is, which is also one of our goals. Next. So here's, uh, here's four young men right here. Um, so. I would tell you that that's, uh, we appreciate them smiling for this picture. It's not all smiles in the gym. Um, matter of fact, Ariel, if you go back one quick slide, um, you can see a young man, Tyler, right here, uh, Tyler with Down syndrome, uh, and Josh working out. What I love about this picture is, just like every other picture, it tells a story. Tyler was not all smiles. As a matter of fact, uh, Tyler's mother told me the very first day that he entered uh, our GTO program, she said, Travis, I'm going to sit right here in the lobby because Tyler is scared of heights. And I said, uh, that's okay, ma'am. I said, we take the stairs everywhere we go. We don't ride elevators. We're all about uh, increasing physical fitness and endurance. And she says, I don't think you understand. My son is scared of heights. And I heard you say something about a treadmill. I said, yes, ma'am. We get on the treadmill, the elliptical machine. We hit the heavy bag for anger management and cardiovascular endurance every single day. She says, well, I told you my son is scared of heights. That treadmill sits about, sits about one to two inches off the ground. So, whew, that was a new experience for us. So I physically lifted Tyler up and placed him on the treadmill, um, and, 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 and we, we, we bonded. Um, he had a few uh, not so wonderful words to share with me uh, on that first day, and, but what I'll tell you is, we helped him overcome a fear. 
We helped him overcome anxiety and fear to the point that they went out and bought all brand new gym equipment, came back the next day smiling, and he lost about 20 pounds in our program, which was phenomenal. Next. There they are in the gym, uh, four individuals right there. As you can see, what I love about them is they have varying disabilities. Uh, two of these young men even overcame childhood cancer. Um, so it's a very, very heartfelt program. Um, it is warm and fuzzy, but it's not all warm and fuzzy uh, in the same breath. And we're going to talk about some of the other things we do in just a moment. Next. So we have a formal graduation. We have a very formal orientation process to our program. We make sure our individuals are fully vetted in partnership with organizations like the um, Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, which have been wonderful, the vocational rehabilitative counselors that work with a lot of different individuals with, with, with I and DD. Um, but we have a wonderful orientation process to quickly set the tone and surround them with all their local first responders. And we get hundreds of uniform personnel that come out to welcome them into the organization. We do the exact same thing, the next slide, we do the exact same thing with graduation. So we have a very formal graduation process, just as formal, just as nice as we would for the police academies, for the fire academies. Um, we don't slight them on anything. It is just as nice. As a matter of fact, our police chief jokingly pulled me aside one day and said, why can't we get this many people to come out for a police graduation? Because this is special. This is unique. This is heartfelt. This is, this is way deeper than, than anything um, that we do on a daily basis. Um, it's totally impactful in its, in its changing lives. So what you're seeing right here is you see uh, that little shiny bald head there. Kind of looks like the one you're looking at right now. But behind me is a lot of the different job coaches. They're full-time first responders that work uh, for GTO on their days off as part-time job coaches and mentors for these, for these individuals that are GTO cadets. The other thing that you're seeing right here is what I think is so cool is you're seeing the fire chief, the police chief, and the elected sheriff all on board with us, um, not just welcoming, but shouldering up and being a part of this process to fully include these individuals into our community and into our public safety agencies. So it's not just um, just street level police officers, but it's street level police officers and detectives and firefighters on up to the mayor, the town manager, the police chief, the sheriff, the fire chief, which is which has totally been incredible. Next. So one of the things we do is, is uh, you know, we want to make folks feel very proud of being through uh, the process in graduating the GTO program, which is a 16-week uh, internship-based program, by the way. Uh, this is a young man named Jacob who is very proud, and we also have a professional photographer come in, um, and we frame their portraits and give them all kinds of cool gifts, of course. But we allow them also to retain their uniforms, and once they graduate, they are also a part of the GTO Alumni Association for Life. Um, it would be cruel and unusual for us to give uniforms to these young men and women and then pull them back and keep them like we do with uh, uh, police officers that, we, uh, uh, that, that have to depart for whatever reason from their agencies. So we don't do that, of course. It's very important that they're allowed to keep their uniforms um, for life. And um, we have monthly socials and gatherings and get-togethers um, with, with themselves, amongst themselves, as well as with a lot of the different first responders um, who wish to continue our relationship with one another even after graduation. Next. Um, so, so here's a young man here, Josh Leonard. Once again, this is just a nice little photographic image of, his, uh, uh, of him on graduation day. Next slide. So one of the things that we also like doing is, yes, this is a training program. Yes, it's growth through opportunity. It's a two-way street for first responders to grow personally and professionally with their disabilities awareness uh, training. Absolutely. It's also a way for individuals, like I said, with varying uh, disorders and disabilities to gain much-needed job, life, social skills, enhanced confidence. But it's also about doing all of those things and then trying to one-up ourselves by working very diligently to 
try to obtain paid employment for these individuals. And for most of them, it's paid employment, receiving an actual paycheck for their work for the very first time in their life after the GTO program. So this is a fine example. I, I just love these pictures because these kids, are, they, they warm my heart. Uh, if you ever spent much time around them, uh, they would warm your heart as well. They're extremely contagious. Uh, matter of fact, morale within the police department even went up uh, when these individuals were with us in the GTO program. Folks were actually looking forward to coming to work, some of them for the first time in a while, truth be told, but they were actually looking forward to coming to work just so they could interact uh, with these fine young men and women. So that's phenomenal. So this is a picture here of Joshua obtaining his very first paycheck. Um, and what a proud day. What, a, what an exciting opportunity for these young men. Next. So, so what I love about this picture here, uh, as you can tell, I probably have a little bit different approach to, to, uh, to uh, PowerPoint presentations. I don't do much wordage whatsoever. I'd like to, I'm just a firm believer that pictures paint a thousand words. Um, so hopefully uh, everyone out there in the viewing audience is, is simply looking at these images while I'm, while I'm trying to paint a decent picture for you about them. This is Times Square for anybody who has uh, been to New York City. And what I love about this picture is this is Shannon and Tyler. Um, and we were up there for the National Down Syndrome Society's Buddy Walk uh, on New York. And what's so cool about this is Tyler, the young man in the green shirt um, who happens to have Down syndrome, won the national award for, as the Dan Piper um, Self-Advocate of the Year and was honored in Washington, D.C. Um, just this past year after completing our GTO program and building that much needed confidence that he needs. Um, so next slide. So right after that event, we, we, here we are with the NYPD, and you can see us, we did a little walk around uh, Central Park, and anybody who's been to New York City knows that's no small park, uh, nor is it a small walk. But the coolest thing about this picture right here, because I like to tell stories about each one of these images, so bear with me, is the, the young man on my right, um, right in front of the NYPD car, that's a young man named Shannon, and Shannon um, is a phenomenal young man who has cerebral palsy. And Shannon um, did not have much leg strength because Shannon um, unfortunately had to spend a lot of time in a wheelchair. Um, and he came to our GTO program. And one of the things that I wanted to do on behalf of Shannon and his entire family was, was boost confidence in him, boost his physical endurance and his leg strength. That way he would be able to walk independently, which also would give his caretakers, his parents, a little break from time to time. So we did that, and uh, they changed his diet, and they put him on a special diet, and we did a lot of physical training. We walked everywhere all day long uh, as a part of the program, and then we changed clothes and worked out even more, which I know is completely exhausting. But that in conjunction with changing his diet, um, I believe the young man now has lost over 40 pounds. He's actually out walking, and the only time he really even needs assistance is just with some balance issues going up and down the stairs. So this is a very proud day with Tyler and Shannon because after coming through the GTO program, Shannon actually walked through Central Park with us and his mother and father. Um, so what an exciting day. Next. So, um, so we created some pretty unique vehicles as a part of our GTO program in conjunction with the city of Roanoke. Again, GTO, it's, uh, um, it operates as a full 501c3 nonprofit organization, which I head up. And we work in conjunction with a lot of different localities. And this particular, our first locality uh, is the city of Roanoke Police Department in Virginia, in Southwest Virginia. You can see the GTO thin blue line across the hood. You can see police that has the autism awareness insignia through the letters, growth through opportunity. Um, and across the back, well, I'm going to hold that thought for just a second to hit the next slide. There's several vehicles that we have. We have a police, uh, we have a couple police vehicles, marked police cars that are on patrol 24 hours a day to also help break down those barriers and misperceptions about individuals that are a little unique and face unique challenges in this world that have intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, so we also work hard to create unique vehicles, our first responder vehicles in Roanoke, Virginia. So we have police vehicles, sheriff's vehicles, as well as the next slide, an ambulance. And you can see the Down syndrome awareness insignia, the autism awareness insignia. We're working on some, every, some, some other things in conjunction with that. 
So my point is this. Um, of course, I think it's a pretty cool program. Uh, of course, I'm a little biased in that regard to the GTO program, so forgive me. But I really, what I think is so cool about it is we're not just sitting back behind closed doors. We're in your face about breaking down barriers and misperceptions to a lot of different disabilities out there, which is changing lives. It's changing people's mentalities and misperceptions. So you're seeing ambulances, police cars, you're seeing um, sheriff's office vehicles been on the road with GTO, growth through opportunity, and our insignia, our motto, which is every day is an opportunity to change a life. And it's being headed up by your local first responders. Next. So we reached out um, early on to our fire chief in Roanoke because it was critically important, knowing what I know about a firehouse, and that most of them around the country operate uh, in 24-hour-a-day shifts. Therefore, everything that gets done inside the walls and grounds of a fire department is being done by the firefighters, by the EMTs. So whether that is the cooking, the cleaning, the grocery shopping, the laundry, the bedding, the weed eating, the grass mowing, the painting, whatever is done is conducted by those fine firefighters out here across America. So knowing that, what an excellent opportunity to create and enhance independent living skills for our GTO cadets, our young men and women with varying uh, unique challenges. So we partner them up at the firehouse um, several days a week, and the firefighters are our job coaches and the mentors, um, and, 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 and they're putting our young men and women through uh, exactly, and I mean exactly, what they would do inside the firehouse. And in, in the entire time, they're acquiring skills that they can use that are transferable into a community-based employment setting. Next. All right, so we're winding down here, which I know you're grateful for. Um, but this is uh, an example of some of our partners out here. Of course, everything is all about, uh, anything that's successful is all about partnerships and collaborations. I can assure you of that. No one person, no one entity can do it alone. And we definitely uh, are no different in that regard. Uh, the GTO Growth Through Opportunity we partner with the Ark of the United States, with the, with the DARS, with the Division of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, uh, Radford University, and Jefferson College of Health Science for interns uh, who help supplement our job coaches, which has been phenomenal. Of course, the uh, local Down Syndrome Association of Roanoke, the National Down Syndrome Society, and the Special Olympics. Uh, there's more out there, so uh, please forgive me if I failed to mention you. Yes, we do have a few more. Uh, I'll work on uh, getting a little better at that, but that's a that's a good little snapshot of who we partner with. Next. So folks often ask us, well, that's, that's cool, but let's talk more about the employment for individuals that, that, that successfully graduate the GTO program. And I tell them it's very easy. It's, it's very easy. We work very hard to get our GTO cadets that graduate community-based jobs at exactly the same businesses that you or I um, work, would have worked, should have worked, potentially right out of high school, right out of college, um, as, our, as some of them as our very first jobs. So this is a fine example right here of some of the places that have hired our GTO cadets. So thank you so much for, for partnering with us and, and, and opening your doors up and, uh, and, and giving these young individuals who desperately need it and deserve it uh, an opportunity to feel empowered, and earn a paycheck for the first time in their life. Next. So once again, you know, one of the favorite, favorite slides I, I love is um, this one right here that I actually took with my cell phone. And I love it because you can see Josh and Tyler right here. You can see them in their GTO cadet uniform. They, 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 I mean, when I look at this, I see nothing but pride. I see nothing but confidence. I see self-esteem. I see self-worth. And what I also see is I see it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business setting like anywhere else. Yes, it's a police department, but you can see a lieutenant and a sergeant working in the background um, doing some, uh, some office and, and clerical work. It's a, the police department is, is, is a building. It's an office setting like every other, uh, uh, every other building or most every other buildings in the world. It's just what we look at and what we're dealing with each and every single day is much different than your average business out there. But it's a great environment to learn. It's a warm environment. It's a professional environment for these young men and women to gain the skills necessary to be launched into life successfully. And who better do it with than their local first responders, which, by the way, 
if and when they ever have to call 911, we're the exact individuals that are going to respond and we are better trained than ever before on how to deal with your personal situation. So negative encounters, positive encounters, way up. So I'm going to end right here, but I just uh, want to remind everybody that our, that our motto for GTO Growth for Opportunity is exactly what is right here, and that is every day is an opportunity to change a life. Every single day is an opportunity to change a life, and that could be a life of a first responder as well as the life of an individual that has an intellectual or developmental disability. So that's what we work hard to do, and we're going to continue to do and strive to expand our program across the nation. So Ariel and Leanne, thank you for allowing us to be a part of this webinar today. All right, thank you so much, Travis. We really appreciate that. Before we turn to our final set of presenters, which is actually yours truly, I'm Leanne Davis, the director of the center. I just wanted to remind everyone that you can start or continue posting your questions for all of the presenters in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. And then right after this last set, um, we will start getting to those questions. So with that, Leanne, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, introduce yourself and start talking about Pathways to Justice. Great. Thank you, Ariel. And I just want to thank all of our wonderful uh, presenters today on this webinar. Um, I've been working in this area of criminal justice and disability advocacy for over 20 years and can tell you that we have come very far uh, in terms of really bringing the issue of disabilities more into the criminal justice world and having deeper connections and deeper conversations around this issue. And that's really been the goal of the National Center here and of the ARC. So just thank you so much to the wonderful presenters today because it gives us all a lot of hope, um, a lot of uh, stronger determination to continue doing the work that we're doing. And um, it's just exciting to see how far we've come uh, but we know that there's still so much more that we want to do. So that's why uh, we, Ariel and I also wanted to talk to you today about uh, our Pathways to Justice training program that we created uh, with support through the Department of Justice. And um, one of the things that, of course, we've already talked about today is the issue of community living that can lead to more involvement in the criminal justice system. Um, just simply being more involved in the community uh, can lead to potential rise in these situations. Uh, we also know that many times the disability is invisible or unrecognized by criminal justice professionals. And in fact, it is that specific segment of uh, people that have disabilities that we're most concerned about. Uh, it's individuals that function, that function at a higher level um, who, who potentially will not disclose that they have a disability. Um, it's people that have uh, like fetal alcohol spectrum disorder where it may not be visible at all that they have a disability, but there is some social emotional issues um, that are created due to brain damage from uh, when a mother drank while she, while she was pregnant. So we've got some real um, hidden disabilities out there that when these individuals come into the criminal justice system, it really creates this um, very risky dynamic for that person if the disability isn't recognized or appropriate supports or accommodations aren't provided. So um, sometimes people with IDD are unable to protect their own rights. And where we really see the issues um, heightened is in these specific examples that we provided here on this slide. Uh, we have uh, two columns here. One is victim witnesses and the other is suspect defendants. And I also want to point out that um, many times people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are involved in the system as both. And actually, um, one of the, the vision for this center was to be able to address both of those issues within this population. Many times we found that when we tried to go get funding to um, really look at this issue, we could only get funding for victims' issues, for example. Uh, we weren't able to look at it holistically and be able to take into account all the different situations 
where a person with a disability is getting involved in the system. So we think it's very important, whether we're training um, law enforcement or attorneys or victim service providers, 911 dispatchers, um, those correctional officers, juvenile justice, we feel like it's important that they all understand that there is a, a much more of a risk for someone with a disability to be either a victim of a crime or a suspect defendant. Um, with underneath victim witnesses, uh, we listed some, some issues specific to this population. We know that many times victims with disabilities are not considered credible witnesses. Um, we know from the National Crime Victim Survey uh, that they're um, more likely to be targeted for victimization due to their disability. They have much more substantial um, challenges when they, when they think about reporting uh, a, a, a crime against them. And then also they can confuse actions for friendships, and that's where the, the judgment part of this and knowing who they can trust and what a safe relationship looks like. That's very important um, that that kind of training and information is provided, and yet many times that kind of training and education isn't provided um, at an early age, and it's not something that they're very familiar with. And so that creates a higher risk of involvement too. And then just the lack of inclusive services for people with disabilities overall. And then if you look at the, the right side of the slide under suspects and defendants, uh, we know that competency is a huge issue here. Um, in fact, we uh, did a white paper on competency issues that is available on our website. It was probably the most difficult uh, white paper to write to date within the center because the issues are very um, complex. And what we try to do is break down those issues for both disability advocates and attorneys who work in the field to better know how to support individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities around competency uh, issues within the court system. Um, also, the cloak of competence, which means someone may pretend to understand more than they do, is, uh, continues to be an issue. Uh, we see that there's much more eagerness to please, to please people in authority, uh, to, pe to please people in uniform, um, and this can lead to false confessions, um, it can uh, really cause an issue in terms of having clear communication. And then they may also be confused about who is responsible in a criminal justice situation and may, and may actually say things that didn't happen just because they're trying to please someone in authority. So when we talk about Pathways to Justice and why it's so important to have this kind of education, we try to look at the kind of professionals that we're, that we're training. And, and try to think, you know, what would make them really want this kind of training for, for themselves? Well, number one is we know that this is a high-risk population. Um, when we're talking to those in the, the, the fields of policing and um, within the legal field and with victim advocates, you know, these individuals took those jobs for a reason. And many times that desire to have justice for people is, is deep in who they are and what they do. And when they come to realize just how, how the, the risk is so much higher within this population, it really can light a fire there to want to do more, to have more education, not just for themselves, but those who the, that they work with as well. We also bring out that, that people with disabilities is the single largest minority group in the United States, and that if you don't know someone with a disability or, or you don't yourself have a disability, that one day you probably will that this issue affects us all, and that it's important that we all have an equal understanding, um, an equal um, uh, way to really communicate with each other, and to know how to um, provide, look at potential solutions when we can't communicate or when there is an, where there's an accommodation needed and we're not sure what it is, to really speak to each other about what needs to happen next in those situations. And then also, um, an effective response equals less lawsuits uh, for police departments. Of course, every, every police department, um, attorney's offices, you want to have a positive public perception of who you are, of your profession. And the more that we're having these open conversations and we're having programs um, like uh, People on the Go, Maryland's program that spoke earlier, 
um, as well as GTO and the great work that Albuquerque is doing, we can see this really makes a difference in the community. Um, we've seen it with the statistics that were shared earlier. And the key message that we all want to be bringing out is that everyone deserves an equal opportunity for justice. It shouldn't be reserved just for um, able-bodied individuals. It should be for everybody. Everyone deserves that chance. And now I am going to turn it over to Ariel to talk a little bit more about the components of our Pathways to Justice training. Great. Thank you so much, Leanne. So you heard Leanne describe the big picture problems that we see in the criminal justice system, particularly for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And of course, we see problems throughout with people with other types of disabilities too. Um, so we tried to come up with a solution that uh, we think addresses a lot of these issues, but also addresses the police use of force issue in particular. And we think to really be successful, a solution has to be based in a community, in a local community, and incorporate agencies and other folks um, who are part of that community directly. So that's kind of our main description, I would say, of Pathways to Justice. It is a comprehensive community-based program designed to train uh, first responders, law enforcement, and other criminal justice professionals about uh, the issues facing people with disabilities in the criminal justice system. There are two key parts to our program. Uh, the first is what we call a disability response team, and the second is a rights-based training. Um, it's an all-day training for different criminal justice professionals in a particular community. So I want to start with the disability response team. And you also hear me call them DRTs for short. So before we ever come in and try to train criminal justice professionals, uh, including first responders, about disability, we create what's called a, a disability response team, a DRT in that community. And a DRT will be made up of a multidisciplinary team of professionals, of advocates, of people with disabilities themselves, possibly some family members, et cetera. So you can see on the slide here the different, the different pieces that typically operate within a DRT. It includes law enforcement, it includes victim advocates in the community, uh, attorneys, typically prosecution and defense attorneys, um, our local and state chapters of the ARC, other disability organizations, including self-advocacy groups, um, um, and those are, those are, I would say, are probably the big, the big ones that come up in DRTs. So that's who's in the DRT, and we ask the DRT to do several things. Um, so one of their main jobs is to increase awareness and increase awareness of disability, of disability issues, but also to debunk myths and stereotypes relating to disability that we frequently see and also frequently see, unfortunately, in the criminal justice system. Uh, the DRT is also there to help criminal justice professionals identify people with disabilities. Uh, one of the things we encounter um, quite frequently is that people will say, well, I just, I can't tell who has a disability. Um, and that's very relevant. We have some estimates say that about 80% of people with disabilities have hidden disabilities, so disabilities that are not easily observable on the outside. Um, so we come in and we try to give uh, criminal justice professionals tips and tools to help them identify potential disability and the people that they're trying to serve in their community. Uh, the DRT is also going to be um, a resource for providing supports and actual accommodations in the community. So when someone with a disability is entangled in the criminal justice system, the DRT should be activated and be there to uh, help provide support, resources, et cetera, to that individual and to the criminal justice professionals who are interacting with that individual. They are also going to be able to know about the local resources available in their community, and that will be a really great help to first responders and other folks that maybe aren't familiar with all the resources that do exist currently for people with disabilities. Um, but in addition to that, the DRT is there to help identify and create new resources as needed. Uh, it is very much the case that in many communities across the United States, we don't have all the resources, especially community-based resources we need to support people with disabilities living in the community. So they are also there to identify those and help create them in their communities if that's possible. And then the last thing that we ask the DRT, DRT to do is really keep up training efforts. 
Uh, you know, you can have training once, but if you had a training once 15 years ago, uh, it's probably not going to stay fresh in your mind. You're not going to remember what you learned. So we really encourage our DRTs uh, after they've had a, our training to really keep those training efforts going and keep them up um, and really repeat all of those things. So you may be wondering how DRTs kind of fit into the bigger picture. So up here at this top arrow you see on the slide, that is myself, Leanne, and our, our team, the National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability. Uh, we're based out of the national office here in, in DC. Uh, Leanne does work remotely in Texas, though, I have to say. Um, right underneath the national level, we have the state level, which is our state chapters. Uh, we have state chapters of the ARC almost in every state, not quite every state, um, but we do have a rather large pre uh, presence. We have 650 state and local chapters all over the U.S. Um, so chances are there is a chapter near you or near your um, or in your community. We also, like I said, have local chapters that would come in under the state chapter. They're the ones that really tend to provide um, services directly to people with disabilities. Our state level chapters tend to do more state-based advocacy, um, monitoring legislation and those kinds of things. And then up here at the national level, we're trying to provide support, resources, education about best practices, all those kinds of things and pushing it down through our chapters into the community. Our, the DRT will actually have um, the, a local chapter or a state chapter in some cases be a part of the DRT and they're typically what I would call the hub or the lead of the DRT. So they're kind of the force that keeps everybody together um, but also identifies who should be on the DRT uh, in that particular community whether it's other disability organizations or advocates, or if we need more of a law enforcement presence, more attorneys, our chapters really take the lead in making sure the DRT um, is composed of people who are knowledgeable about disability and criminal justice in their community. And then of course, there'll be other professionals and things operating um, in tandem with the DRTs in every community. So that's kind of how it all fits together. So let's talk a little bit about the training itself once we have a DRT formed in a community. Uh, then myself and Leanne as a co-trainer, we come in and do an eight hour all day training with folks. And we're targeting three general professions. First, we're targeting law enforcement um, and some first other first responders, but mostly law enforcement. Uh, second, we're targeting attorneys, both criminal and prosecuting attorneys. And third, we're targeting victim advocates because we think these are the professions that will interact uh, most closely with people with disabilities who are involved in the system in some way. But also these are the folks who will be more likely to recognize uh, that a person might have a disability and therefore need um, supports, accommodations, or other kinds of services. So in the beginning of the beginning of the day, we do cover disability and disability culture. We talk a lot about language and what disability means to the disability community, what it means to the criminal justice community and how those definitions sometimes, you know, don't work together. Uh, we also talk about how to identify and communicate more effectively with people with IDC in particular, but other types of disabilities as well. We try to go over key disability rights laws and the idea of accommodations, accommodations and what that means under the Americans with Disabilities Act and specifically what does it mean for criminal justice professionals. And I think most importantly, we try to point out for all of our trainees where the cracks are in the criminal justice system, in particular for people with disabilities. Where do they fall through? Where are they not identified? Where are they not receiving services, supports, and accommodations? Um, so those are the big things that we, um, we talk about. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Leanne to talk about where we've trained in 2017. Uh, so far and where we will be next. Leanne, I can't hear you. You might be, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. I, I did want to mention that an, an, an important component of the Pathways to Justice training, uh, as Ariel was mentioning about talking about disability culture, um, is that we work closely with um, advocates there at our different sites, uh, at the training site, to ensure that, um, that, that there are actual lived experiences shared during the training um, and that there is an opportunity to have as much leadership 
as self-advocates want to have during the, that module specifically talking about disability issues. Um, and that they can also talk about personal experiences um, within the criminal justice system in the, in the profession specific modules meaning that if they had an encounter with a police officer and they wanted to give that as an example of what could work better or what worked great for their situation, they could talk about that within our law enforcement module or also within the victim service provider module. So that's a key piece to this training as well, is ensuring that we are bringing every voice to the table around this issue. And I can tell you um, some of the uh, lessons learned for us is that one of the most amazing things that has come out of this experience with the Pathways to Justice training is this is often the first time that the different professional groups have ever had a chance to sit down with each other in a non-volatile or defensive way to talk about these issues. So we, you know, bring a case scenario to the table. We break everyone down into a, a mini DRT and then they're able to talk about this case and talk through, well, you know, why would you do that? And what is your next step in the process in helping someone with autism, for example, um, give a testimony or, or um, talk about the crime that was committed against them? Or where do you go? What resources do you use if you have someone who um, is in need of care and it's two in the morning? Um, so it's really looking at being able to look at very specific uh, community level issues that that specific area is dealing with. And every community is so different. But we do have an opportunity with Pathways to Justice to look at this comprehensively and say, there may be just two or three tweaks in the system of how you guys are addressing this issue that if that's done, it can really make a big difference. And so we know that police officers alone, you know, can't fix this, uh, that the disability community alone can't. And it's really an opportunity for us to say, what can we do together to look at this strategically in our community and come up with some simple solutions that we think will work. And um, I should add to that too around evaluation uh, we're looking at how to take our, our action plans at the, so at the end of the training day, we ask individuals to create an action, some action steps that they can take that would look, that would um, improve the situation, um, help, help them feel more confident in serving people with IDD. And we also ask our disability response teams to come up with an action plan. And what we're going to do is start evaluating those plans very carefully and start tracking based on this training and based on creating these DRTs, where do we see changes taking place? Um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, depending on the different sites that we're talking to and that we're working with, um, what, what those kinds of changes are over time. So we're excited to really see the outcome of that. We know that training alone is not going to change attitudes um, and change um, the culture long term, we have to build in a way to create ongoing conversations around these issues. And that's what Pathways to Justice is doing. So we've already been to um, the Ark of Winnebago, Boone and Ogle counties in Illinois in March, um, and also the Ark of New Mexico in April, which is why we have such a, the speakers that we had on for our webinar today. Um, just had a wonderful opportunity to sit down with their CIT crisis, um, their crisis intervention training team, and be able to talk through uh, some very specific issues around what's needed in advanced training on this issue. And then we'll be going next week to the Ark of Loudoun County in Virginia, and then in Massachusetts in June, Texas in July, and then in California, um, we'll be going to California in August. And alongside of providing these one-day trainings and getting the evaluation back on these different sites, we're also looking at working with CIT International to uh, work together in creating an advanced or enhanced course on um, intellectual and developmental disabilities specifically. 
So that's really working nicely since the Arc, um, since the um, Albuquerque Police Department is looking at doing that. I just recently spoke to another police department in Virginia looking at developing a policy around how to um, how police officers can better serve and interact with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So we see a lot of um, promising things coming uh, coming down in the future. And uh, we're just excited about being a part of this and about being able to bring you guys through these webinars, through our publications, um, the different promising practices that are going on throughout the country. And um, I did want to mention, too, that if you are interested in bringing Pathways to Justice to your area, to so please contact me directly, and my email is there. Again, we, uh, we've, we've had I get a total of five pilot sites back in 2015, and we have done two trainings, and we have four more to go. So we're looking at for opportunities to continue to bring Pathways to Justice to different areas throughout the country, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. And thank you so much for, um, for just listening to a little bit more about Pathways to Justice, and we're eager, I think, now to wrap it up and take some questions from, from the audience. Thank you, Leanne. So if you have questions for any of the panelists, you can go ahead and type those in the Q&A box, which shows up on the right-hand side of your screen. Remember, if we don't get to your question today, you can send your question to this email address on the slide, and it's also in the chat box, nccjdinfo at thearc.org, arc with a C. Um, and we can follow up with you after the webinar if we don't get to your question. Also, I wanted to remind everybody that right after the webinar, a short survey will pop up. I just want to encourage everyone to take just a few minutes to fill that out. It really gives us some meaningful feedback and make sure that we're bringing you webinars that are very useful and helpful to you out in your own communities. And then also, please don't forget to register for our next and actually final webinar in our 2017 Policing in People with Disabilities series, which is scheduled for September 21st, 2017, at the same time as this one, 1 p.m. Eastern. The link to register is in the PowerPoint but it also appears in the chat box, so you can register right now for that if you'd like. Um, and with that, so speakers, um, I just want you to be prepared to jump on here and respond. What you can do is turn on your cameras, and then if you would like to respond to a question, just unmute yourself and, and, um, you know, and respond to the question. If I think the question is directed in particular at a speaker, I will let you know that. I'll say I believe the question is for so-and-so. So that's kind of how this will work. Um, so it looks like my presenters are getting back on their cameras. And to start us off, this is gonna be a question for our law enforcement folks. From a law enforcement perspective, how does chronic homelessness uh, complicate recidivism for people with disabilities? One more time, Mary, I'm sorry. From a law enforcement perspective, how does chronic homelessness complicate recidivism for people with disabilities? Well, I think homelessness is, is its own issue. We struggle with it here locally, but if someone's not in services, I mean, I can only imagine what it would be like to live on the streets, and you're going to constantly get into uh, trouble. We just recently got issued orders to, to not arrest on misdemeanors, so, and this is common, like, in California and some other places, to, to try to reduce the overpopulation in jail and in the criminal justice system in that sense. But so sometimes I think recidivism and the sense of staying homeless is it's hard to navigate the uh, system in general, be it, you know, that you have a disability, you don't have a disability. So if you are having a disability that impairs any kind of avenue of your life, you're going to have difficulty getting into services. And you have more frequent contact with law enforcement because it's unfortunate that people don't like seeing people who are homeless. So people call police for everything, and they call us a lot because there's a homeless individual in the corner. You know, it's not against the law to be homeless, but we get a lot of calls for that. And I'm not sure that answered that question at all. <laughs> Anybody else have thoughts on that one? Okay, sounds like no. Um, so in that case, we'll move on to our next question here. 
How do police determine if an individual has a disability when they come across a person, quote, acting out? Are your statistics based on information provided by callers only? So it sounds like another question for APD. So we train our officers to look for um, more behavior cues. I don't think anyone should go up and be like, this person has a disability. We're not clinicians, we're not there for that. And so we look at the different behavior cues. You know, some disabilities have physical attributes that you, you can tell, but we normally get the information and we ask officers to provide it. So even if a call comes in saying, my loved one who has schizophrenia is doing this, or my loved one who's living with autism is doing this, we still rely on the law enforcement officer's perspective. So they'll, they'll go out there and they take in that information, but it's from their interaction. So either the person self-discloses, and then they'll say this person is someone who said they have autism, or this person is someone that says they're living with bipolar, or they take them to the hospital and they say, because of their, you know, our interaction and their behavior, I believe it's, it's due to some kind of mental health thing. But that's more mental health, behavioral health, as opposed to intellectual disabilities or any kind of disability in that. And so we get that information directly from officers, not from the call. Great, thank you. And we did actually have a question come up about the use of the term mental health versus intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we do can treat those separately, and as you just said, Matt, they are separate things. Um, so we hope that was clarified over the course of the presentation. If you do have questions about what is a mental health disability versus an intellectual or developmental disability, send me an email at nccjdinfo.org, and I would be happy to um, send you some fact sheets and other resources about the difference. Um, so the next question is actually for you, Travis. Um, there were some comments that GTO is a great program. Uh, people want to know about if the program is located in other states besides Virginia, um, and if not, how can people replicate this program in other states? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, we appreciate the compliment. Um, we try to be very innovative and forward thinking in our, uh, in our efforts to change uh, the culture um, of law enforcement, first responders, as well as the entire culture of uh, the partnership amongst individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, um, like we said earlier, you know, we created it right here in Roanoke, Virginia, and I do head up the organization. Um, we are slowly expanding, and we have about 15 partnering agencies at this point in time. It's been highly successful thus far, and we're working behind the scenes right now to expand nationwide, um, whereas we want to, for lack of a really bad term, to franchise out the GTO program to public safety agencies all around the country. And of course, our goal is to be in every single community in the entire country, to, to totally change those cultures, those mindsets, and those misperceptions. So you can actually contact us through our website, uh, which is gtocadets.org. Uh, we're on Facebook as well through GTO Cadets, and you can email me personally at gtocadets at gmail.com, and we would love to be able to bring the GTO program to your community. Great, right, thank you. Uh, the next question is about training more generally and for the folks that were mentioning a training program. Uh, let's see, oops, sorry, I just lost my place. Okay, there it is. Are any of the training curricula mentioned today inclusive of the intersections of disability and race, disability and gender identity, disability and sexual orientation, et cetera. So for anyone who talked about training today, um, you could talk about intersectionality and how that appears in your training program. I, I can talk to Go ahead, guys. I'll just jump in here real quick and just tell you that um, we're, we're fully inclusive with the GTO Growth Through Opportunity Program, irregardless of someone's nationality, race, sexuality. Um, it is completely irrelevant to us. We welcome all people where you are, uh, meet them where they are, and just love to partner with all people because that, that, those are the individuals that comprise any community around the United States. So I think it's very important as a community-based community policing initiative for Roanoke, Virginia, and other uh, agencies around the country to really reach out to all individuals despite, uh, despite our differences. That's critically important. Great, 
this is, I was going to be talking on this one, and I'm not I'm trying to bring up the question on our screen too, just to make sure I hit all the points. But we don't have any specific classes about or, or you know, lectures on this is the disability as it associates with race, gender, or any kind of sexual orientation or identity. We do, we have an open door for training when it comes to our ongoing Tuesday meetings or Tuesday trainings. And so that is actually one that has come up about gender identity, um, you know, and having a class for that. And here in our state, in New Mexico, they did require all law enforcement to take a 30-minute class on sexual orientation, and which is really just a video that every officer had to watch and take a test. But we don't really gear any of our current lectures or materials or, or curriculum towards those topics specifically. Leanne, did you want to add anything to that about Pathways? Yes. Um, yes, this is Leanne uh, talking about Pathways to Justice. And in our training, we, uh, we talk about bias and the effect of unintentional or intentional bias that uh, we all can have in our different professions um, about people with disabilities, about different races, about people with disabilities who are um, from, you know, run the gamut of different races as well. And we also include um, specific case scenarios that get to that issue of that intersectionality. Um, in addition to that, we, our last webinar um, uh, was on intersectionality issues and we're really wanting to explore that with our different um, advisor, adv advisors within NCCJD as well as our partner network. Uh, we're seeing that that issue is something that needs to be included in everything that we do. And so we, um, we're we doing that, I would say, heavily, um, more heavily within Module 2 and then in places within our law enforcement area or module, uh, but we are looking at ways to expand that as well. Right. And I would just add that um, we're also constantly trying to add you know, information and resources that are of a more intersectional nature. We are working on a white paper right now that will include all of these different areas and how they intersect with disability and how that can complicate issues of policing um, when you have bias and you have all these other forms of intersectionality. So that white paper won't come out until probably September um, of this year, but keep an eye out for that. That will delve into this issue far more deeply um, and We'll be able to really explore that with a lot of experts from around the country. So a couple of more questions related to training, and I'm going to ask both of these because I think they're, they're, they're related and I believe all the training folks could kind of speak to these. So how do you decide uh, what to train law enforcement on specifically? And kind of a second question to that, how do you train law enforcement differently when it comes to psychiatric disability or mental illness? versus intellectual and developmental disability. So the first part is how do you decide how to, what you're gonna train law enforcement on to begin with? And the second piece is how do you train police differently in regards to psychiatric disability versus intellectual and developmental disability? I don't know if you want us to go first on that one. Go right ahead. Yeah. So here we use um, the ADDI model, developing curriculum. So we'll use a needs assessment first. So we'll use some of the data that Dr. Winograd will pull. We'll sometimes survey officers, um, look at any kind of current trends in our community for what's lacking. So we, for a while there in Albuquerque, had an increased use of people living with a mental illness and increased use of force, so including a lot of um, shootings, police shooting people living with mental illness. And so we saw a big need and a big outcry for that. And, and how are we addressing these things? So we look at data, we look at trends, we look at you know the, the current services we have in our community, and then we develop our curriculum based off of that. And so we have always included in the state curriculum, which is just a mandate, always has a section for intellectual disabilities. It's pretty short. We include extra for that for training just because we do see a need and a, a misunderstanding, but a lot of it's lack of resources for officers. They're just not quite sure what to do if they're out with somebody in need that, that has this ability. And so we use that, we, we put it into a curriculum, and then we test on it. And so 
So then we look at the data, see is it actually improving? Do we need to change our approach to it? You know, it, does it need to be more lecture based, more one on one? And so one of the things, and then kind of determining what's the difference, it depends on what you get out of your needs assessment. So if, let's say, officers and the public said, every time that law enforcement interacts with people with uh, developmental disability, they always send them to the wrong resource, or they take them to the hospital and they should be taking them back to their group home or their treatment provider, their day, their day program then we would know, okay, officers are keep going back to the traditional model of jail or of a hospital here locally. And so we have to figure out how do we adjust that and change the culture for that and make them aware of it. Most of our training that how we do it locally though is that we want people to treat everyone the same. So if an officer sees somebody and their characteristics is that they appear to be in a crisis, you know, their emotions seem to be uncontrollable or you know, they're going back and forth with communication techniques. We just tell them the same thing, you know, treat everybody with dignity and respect, and you work on these skills to develop that rapport on it. And then once you have that rapport, you can hopefully negotiate whatever the, the concern is, if it's violence or not, and then how to link them to services. And so what we, we are now developing that eight-hour program after meeting you guys for some continuing stuff. Luckily, and I'm knocking on wood here, we have not had very many negative interactions with our law enforcement historically and people living with intellectual disabilities. We have with people with mental disabilities, our mental health, behavioral health. And so I contribute some of that to the culture of our police department. We employ a business called Adelante, which, which just hires and staffs people with intellectual disabilities. So from your beginning, of your career in law enforcement throughout your constantly day to day you see people living with an intellectual disability and you interact with them so you view them as equals we started noticing people in law enforcement using terms like the schizophrenic the bipolar and almost like us versus them so in that needs assessment we said that we need to include people that are consumers in throughout all of our training because law enforcement here locally was looking at them as being criminals and so we started doing more of a co-teaching with people with major mental illnesses, having panels, kind of like, like what you guys spoke of, some other people spoke of, which I think just really changed perception. Law enforcement needs to see people in a good state and not just in negative. And if you guys are looking at developing programs and, and how to kind of influence mindset, that's really it. You, you have to realize law enforcement, we see the negative of all of society. You don't see someone you know, who has Down syndrome, who has a job. You don't see that in law enforcement. You would see going to a group home because of a fight. So you see the negatives of everything. I, don't, I hope that answered it. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Um, I want to turn to people on the go. I see you guys turned your camera back on and just check in to see if you guys have comments or want to answer that question. Yeah, so when, uh, when we approach our... Um, Train, training model. You know, we uh, started out using the Pathfinders for Autism um, curriculum, and then we took that and modified that so that it was more uh, ID and DD specific. But we don't uh, generally we don't train our our law enforcement officers to make a diagnosis. What we say is, you know, as it has already been said, treat every uh, person with a disability that you meet uh, as really a unique situation and figure out how to build that rapport rather than trying to figure out how to uh, treat a specific uh, issue as part of a uh, person's diagnosis. Yeah, Ariel, could I jump in here for a second? Sure. Uh, I think the video is working. So this is Travis here. So um, I love what uh, with, with what all the gentlemen have stated, and it's uh, it's it's one hundred percent accurate in many regards, especially when the uh, Albuquerque was talking about you know some of those negative encounters and. And things. I mean, truly, that's all you see as a uniform officer, and that's that's all I saw for a multitude of years uh, wearing a uniform. 
Um, and it's, it's sad, but it's the nature of the beast. Uh, therefore, you know, uniform officers, uniform personnel start to, you know, start to develop um, a different mindset than the general population. That's very true. It, it's, it's just a part of the job. But I will tell you, with that being said, that's exactly why it was uh, incumbent upon professionals like myself to try to reverse all of that, because so much of law enforcement is dealing with folks in crisis. I mean, nobody's going to call me when they're having a great day. That's not going to happen. So they only call you in crisis mode. So it was very important for us to change that mindset and create nothing but positive experiences, positive encounters, because I will promise you this. If you are a professional and you have a negative encounter with an individual, that will be ingrained in your mind for a long, long time. But I'll reassure you of one thing, even more important than that, is that if you have an individual with autism or Down syndrome or another intellectual developmental disability and they have a negative encounter with a law enforcement officer, it absolutely is ingrained in their minds for the rest of their life. Not only do they um, spread that negative word through their networking, through their um, community groups and organizations bad-mouthing that particular police department, but you have created one heck of a situation for every other police officer that's coming after you to interact and hopefully leave that family or leave that situation better than, than you receive them. So it's very important for us to create all those positive encounters. That way we can bring a lot of positive thoughts uh, in these individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Great. Thank you, Travis. Um, so we're getting really close to the end of our time. I would just like to ask any of the speakers if you have any final, final comments, if you'd like to share those. Uh, Ariel, this is Leanne. Sure. Uh, so I just wanted to really quickly uh, make a comment to that last question uh, that, in, you know, in terms of deciding what to train on, I think that's a hard question. And I think it depends on where you, you are uh, throughout the country. Working at, at a national level, we get the benefit of seeing all of the different issues that are going on nationally and how it plays out in different communities. And so what we try to do is provide that template of the training, but really customize it um, so that if it, there's a specific issue that law enforcement wants addressed, well, we have an opportunity to sit down with the local disability advocacy organizations and the, the mental health agencies um, to work through some of those issues and talk through those issues. And so it really does depend on what is what that community sees as the issue. Uh, that's really what we try to focus in on with the Pathways to Justice training. Great. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, before we close, I just wanted to remind everyone that we will be posting a, the recording of the webinar, a transcript, and the PowerPoint slides on NCCJD's website. Those should pop up about a week from today. If we didn't get to your question on today's webinar, um, you can email us at nccjdinfo at thearc.org and we will follow up with you. I know some of you had more questions for specific uh, speakers, so what I'll do is I'll relay those questions to the speakers directly so they can follow up with you. Um, and I also just want to remind everyone to take the survey at the end of the webinar that will come up and just say thank you again to all of our presenters um, for taking the time to share with us what you're doing in your own communities about this issue. So thank you so much and thank you all of our audience members for joining us today.